We're live. Hello. I have a chaotic being. He may not be here for long. I love him. I hope he stays forever. He will not. (laughs) (laughs) He is questioning being here at the moment. (laughs) Because mine hates me and I don't know where she is. I'm wearing my um, how to take care of your demon cat shirt. I love that. I love that. (laughs) It felt thematically relevant for this book. It does feel thematically. I was going to say your cat being here, it feels correct for this book. Anyway, welcome to whoever is here. We're discussing today The Strange Beasts of China by Yang. I keep saying The Strange Beasts of China. It's just Strange Beasts of China by Yang. I had articles uh, all the time, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is our inaugural. In, inaugural. Inaugural. Sounds about as close as some, I would something get. Something like something like that. I don't know what's wrong with my webcam, by the way. It keeps doing this overexposed situation. I don't. It's know. because of the book cover. And, I think once you put it down, uh, it'll go away. No, oh, it was doing this the other night too. No, it was. It just is like this. Anyway, um, this is our first live show for the Untitled Chinese Lit Book Club, which I totally meant on titling, and then I just never did, and then now it's too late. So here we are. <laughs> Welcome, Angela. Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Is this my first time live on your channel? That's exciting because you do reading sprints all the time. I'm Angela. Mm. I'm always lurking in Tammy's reading sprints in the chat. My channel is Literature Science Alliance, and I read a bunch of stuff, primarily adult speculative work. So when Tammy was like, hey, do you want to join? And then happened to pick a speculative, and that is the definition. Genre placing this book is so hard. Uh, Mm. I was very excited. (laughs) <laughs> I was thinking of like, cause I, I knew I wanted this to be my first like revamped book club pick. And I was like, who would I, who would I think like actually would like this? And I was like, I feel like this is Angela's wheelhouse. <laughs> yes. Yes. And truly, truly it was like, <laughs> like if people were like, Oh no, this was boring. I'm like, Oh, okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> But no, I mean, and I also do read a lot of literary works, too. And, like, this definitely, like, it weaves between all of the things that I read. So I agree. And I I have cats, and that's about it. That's all you need to know about me. (laughs) Read the book back in April, wanted to discuss. Yes, welcome. This is going to be a very casual discussion. I guess let's start with general thoughts, ratings. I don't know what my rating is yet, Tammy. (sighs) Stress. (laughs) <laughs> what's the range what's the range well okay I, I think i also need to talk about the fact that my ratings are a star higher than tammy's like if tammy gives something a three and a half that's, that's probably true. my like four four and a half like <laughs> yeah that's true i have noticed that i'm like i, I do notice that where i'm like if, if angela gives something a four i'm like that's probably gonna be like a three star read for me but like a yeah. solid three star you know yeah we have different definitions um it's yes I think it's a four and a half and whether it Mm -hmm. sits there or goes down to a four or up to a five depends a lot on, I think the longevity of it in my brain, which I can't tell yet because I just finished it like five days ago. But my instinct is that it's, it enters at four and a half and it can stay there or go up and down because I do use half stars. Like I'm not anti half stars. How about you? Hold on a (laughs) 3.5. Very good star rate. (laughs) I actually I don't know yet like I just I feel like this is so different because I was trying to compare it to so I I constantly compare this to the cabinet by Unsu Kim which I also think you should read I kind of want to and I've been looking at it for my local Mm -hmm. book club so I think I might nominate it for January yeah I think like it's crossed my mind a couple times at the bookstore when I see it on Uh, the tables I love that cover just like as an off topic I love that cover but I was looking at um the cabinet in Su Kim. I was looking at what I rated that, and I rated that I think three stars or three point two five stars. So I feel like three point five is correct for this one here. That's how nice. that's how I feel. Oh, um, I see. I you- love this book. Felt like a mini series TV show that had that type of arc, mm. and like I was all there for that. <laughs> see, yeah, I also liked. I really liked the overarching narrative of this book. Which is why I feel like I like it better than the cabinet because I feel like the overarching narrative of the cabinet is like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> Whereas this one, I felt like everything made sense by the end, and I was like, I see why everything tied together. Um, even though there were like a, 
some stories that stood out more to me than others. Well, and like its oh, episodic sorry. nature also felt really cozy to me. Like I could be grounded mm-hmm. in this individual and I'm like, oh, and we're going to the bar to be with Charlie. And, and yeah. then it did this whole like <laughs> anime thing to me where after like episode three, something dramatic happens and like the tone changes. <laughs> Which has happened to me like, in many an anime. It's villain of the week until until that one moment. And I think in this book it was like, which story would you say was that moment? Because I oh I it was the what, um sacrificial beast at, for me was when I was like oh we, we're darker oh, than I thought. <laughs> oh interesting. Because I think it was like flourishing beast for me was where I was like oh we're getting major drama. Okay, I see. <laughs> I mean, when we get into spoilers, I'll tell you why. Because I don't yeah, want to spoil okay. the thing that, for me, made me feel like, okay. oh, there are, like, stakes. And this is not just, like, <laughs> a, a dark noir in the fall with this depressed character. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't like the professor fellow dude. Right? This well, April, I don't think but... we're supposed to. He's kind no. of <laughs> He's He's really just, like... But I also feel like he's really just kind of, like, there. Like, he doesn't have a personality. He doesn't have a character. He's just kind of this ominous, like, figure. <laughs> I, I mean, and I also, and, like, part of this felt just, like, it was just so weird how we'd go to them having this sort of camaraderie on the telephone or whatever to him, like, mm. calling her an idiot. <laughs> it's just, like, the, that, the quick back and I, forth were a lot. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't really think much of that, to be honest. But I've seen some reviews where people are like, it's so, like, awful that he, like, he just calls her an idiot all the time. And I'm like, is that not normal? Well, you said you physically <laughs> read this, right? Because you don't like the audio narrator. I, so I only physically read the first half. And then I did hybrid read the second half because I was just struggling to read this week. But okay. I did not. But- actually, to put on record, this is not the worst Emily Wu Zeller narrated book on the, um, in in the range of Emily Wu Zeller narrated books that I have read, this is actually one of the better ones. Just to put that out there. <laughs> I mean, I like the narrator, and I do think early on when you have more of the conversation between the professor and her, like what she does with the voice acting of the professor brings a lot more of emotional dynamics to it that I don't know if I would have seen in the text. Like mm. it goes from like calm to actual like yelling, <laughs> like. That is my main problem with Emily Wuzeller as a narrator, and that's why I don't like her. And that's actually why I found the second half of this book to be okay, because a lot of it was just narration. And I think her na- like her narration is okay. It's just when she puts on voices that I'm like, hard pass. But that's interesting that you say that that like puts character into this character that I felt was like very, very bland. Well, I mean, I guess honest. I say I don't know what would have happened if I only read it with my eyes versus that's fair. like, you know, like on the page, I don't think mm. maybe it didn't say they were yelling or whatever. I don't know yeah. what my internal narrator would have done. Mm-hmm. I guess. That's fair. That's fair. But no. but yeah. Um, do we have any other non-spoilery thoughts before we dive in? Because I really just want to I, 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 I it's just, your show. I'm just here. I mean, no, it's all, it's, it's very chill. It's, we're just having a discussion. Um, I mean, not spoiling things. Like, I feel non- like we've already talked about it's episodic and like has that mm-hmm. arc and like, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I guess it has that classic sci fi fantasy trope of who's the monster. But I think done in kind of a yeah. different way, but like it's that's such a classic. Like, I love that theme. Humor. Yeah, I always call it the "What makes a monster, what makes a man." Because I don't know. Are you a musical geek? Have you listened to the Hunchback of Notre Dame? Soundtrack? Okay, so that that movie scared me as a kid. So, and then as an adult, I watched it. I'm like, how is this for kids? And <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. But in the opening number, there's a line in the song that says, "What makes a monster, what makes a man." So every time I read a book that has this theme in my head, I just sing that song. <laughs> And anyway, when I read this book, the first chapter, I was like, that, that is going to be the theme in this book. And I love that theme where you're like, you have these monsters contrasted with man. And then, but like, really, where's the line drawn, right? And I love, I love that. Well, and then the, the theme that. of who is taming who, that comes up a lot. Mm-hmm. And as a cat owner, we all know how that works. We are, wow. we are not the owners. <laughs> Let's be real. <laughs> I have been no, but it's always a compelling question of what makes something human and worth human dignity, which it just comes up all the time exactly. in sci-fi and fantasy and mm-hmm. literary. Mainly because I think we can't accept that we truly don't treat all humans as human. And so we have to mm-hmm. rationalize it by looking at it from this distant lens. 
And mm-hmm. this book definitely looks, I think, it's social issues that like, okay, we just literally added like points to their ears, but this is just human refugees. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, one thing I did want to mention that I have seen in a lot of uh, reviews, especially comparative reviews to the original Chinese text, which I thought was really interesting, is that I didn't really get the set like you you get the sense that at the beginning and the, at the end of each chapter, um, you get snippets of like the actual like bestiary documents. But apparently in the original text, those are written in classical Chinese versus the rest of the text is written in like Sichuan dialect, which is Yanga's like signature, like because she's from Sichuan. So I thought that was really interesting, though, that in the English text, you don't really get a su- I, I mean, I didn't anyway, you get a super like classical feel from the kind no. of bestiary bits. I mean, I guess I did. Okay, so I think the difference, especially and it was jarring first getting into it, it felt mm-hmm. more dry and expository, mm-hmm. kind of like if I was reading a textbook, I don't know if that yes. counts as classical, and then it did switch to a more informal storyteller tone. Mm-hmm. So that's, I think, how they translated that to I agree. what Western readers would interpret it. Because I do think yeah. even when you read like a textbook, like, I don't think classical is how I would think of most no. textbooks either. It was just very dry. Like yeah. very, it's, it was more like scientific in yeah. its delivery. But I, de- I definitely thought it was interesting, though, that it kind of lost that element of it. Because I think it's very interesting to have it, had it written in like classical Chinese, which is basically a dead language at this point. Like, <laughs> so that, that was interesting. Anyway, that was just like a little translation note. Well, I, mean, that I, I also thought out. like the narrative framing of the work was interesting because like you're trying to figure out because she is the the main character is an author for both the news columnist mm-hmm. and books and you're kind of always mm-hmm. wondering am I in the book right now like is this the the book <laughs> that's being mm-hmm. released so yeah yeah I do really like that and I think also this book originally was published as a serial so I think Which it makes, makes complete sense complete sense yeah yeah when I read that like in an article I was like yes this 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 tracks. <laughs> I mean, that's why, like, until I got to the end, like, the last four chapters I read in, like, a day. But every other chapter, I read one a day because that's all I wanted to do. And I was just having fun doing that. I was just like, oh, this is my chapter of this a day. Let's see what monster we're going to see and what trouble we get into. And it was Yeah, I think yeah, you're right. Until you get to kind of probably, like, the second half of the book where the overarching narrative comes in, you're just like, this is this is a fun time. I, you know, we we have a little bit of depression, you know, some, some murders happening. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> You get to figure out which characters are more important than others. You learn more about yeah. the backstory, you know. Exactly. Um, I love the theme of who is the monster. Plus, I just love the characteristics of these beasts and how it made you introspect about humanity. I agree. I think how each beast represents, like, a different aspect of humanity, I think, is really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wonder the process the author went through to decide all the beast names. Because I have to assume that's part of the drawing board process before this is written down. Is like, what are all the beasts? Yeah, um, this was smart. Just something I hadn't really read before. I appreciated. it. I also appreciated it. Shall we jump yeah, into spoilers? Talking about oh, um, a oh, different. Yeah. Okay. What was it called? The cabinet. You said you were the cabinet. Writing? So mm. mine, mine was a Polish translated fantasy. I kept comparing it to The Last Wish by Andrzej Sapkowski. Uh, is that the short story collection one? Yeah, and so that okay. one's the first two short story collections are also very episodic. Mm-hmm. He meets a monster, and we figure out, oh, that's not actually a monster. Mm-hmm. It's kind of twists of Eastern European and oh. grim fairy tales. And then there is an overarching theme where you're trying to figure out who has Geralt run into, who's important to mm-hmm. him, kind of some found family stuff. Um, it's not like this, it's more, you know, noir, contemporary mm-hmm. grounded. But I really liked that. And I mean, that's why I'm so mad that the novels don't lean into that. The novels, they still look at the monstrosities of humanity and all that, but it's not as good as the short <laughs> stories, <laughs> which are so cool. That's interesting. I've never read them because in my head, I've always been like, I'm going to play the video game. <laughs> I mean, that's not going to happen. Both. <laughs> I think the video no, game like... has some of them, but I think it takes place in an alternate future of the Witcher series. Oh, interesting. Interesting. I think. Don't, don't quote me because I haven't played it. I want to buy it and not play it on my PS5 because that's who I am as a gamer. Story of my life. <laughs> Story of my so, life. So that was my like episodic monster book that mm. I kept comparing this to. Yeah. I, yeah, I thought it was really 
well crafted i feel i feel like also sometimes serial works don't translate into novels like once you bind them up they don't really work as well but i felt like this one worked really well because i felt like the main character even though they're unnamed they're still like a very strong like you get a good sense of who they are are they unnamed i thought they i were think unnamed. we get the name at the end i don't know but i was struggling to think of her name and i couldn't figure out if that was just me being bad at things I thought it was because you know sometimes you just don't especially because it's first exactly. person right like mm-hmm. she doesn't think of herself in her own name I don't think she has a name because I thought like I thought near the end I thought it's like oh I finally get her name but then I completely instantly for, forgot it so I forgot everyone's name I remember Charlie <laughs> I can't pronounce the name I the remember Charlie Jung, Jung, Jung Young I liked I him the other guy's name yeah, yeah. um I, I thought it was funny. Of professor. Did he have a name? I did find it funny that Jong Yang's uncle was it his uncle, the other like or whatever. His name was Jong Ren, which I thought was funny because he was a clockmaker, and Jong in Chinese is clock. <laughs> so I just thought that was like a little funny, a funny thing. I don't know if it was intentional or like what the Chinese character for it is, but it sounds a lot like the word clock. So I just thought that was a little funny. <laughs> oh, nice. That's definitely not something I would have noticed. I'm trying to look at the Goodreads to see um, if there is a name. I don't think they're named. Yeah. I do love a good yeah. unnamed narrator. There were some random names of like Methu- Methuselah or whatever. Methuselah, Methuselah? I don't know. Like the mom's friend. Yeah, there were some interesting names in this yep. book. Yeah. But I think all that's right. all my spoiler thoughts. I feel like we can yeah. enter the realm of spoilers. I, I agree. I think it's time to talk spoilers. If you haven't read the book and you don't want to be spoiled, this is this is your warning to exit. All right. Spoilery thoughts. What was your most impactful fate slash favorite beast? Oh, I was going to say story, but I meant I need, to, I need to look up the table of contents again. Um, most impactful. I think I have two, and they were probably two mm-hmm. of the darker chapters. Um, mm-hmm. Sacrificial Beast with Charlie at the end was a lot. Yeah. I really wasn't yeah. expecting this. Like, I, I didn't expect like... him to become like a love interest, but like the reveal that he was a beast, but then also the genocide <laughs> that happened. <laughs> like, I was just like, wow. <laughs> yeah but i also was like expecting charlie to be a character throughout the book so then i was like oh okay. i thought he was just gonna be that weird detective friend like how she like i don't know he was yeah. part of my coziness <laughs> i was like well i i was just like oh she, he's just gonna be the one that she goes to the bar and hangs out with you know like yeah when you watch like i mean the serials you know in the u.s with the dramas like and this is the bar that people go to at the end of the episode and like <laughs> i was very there mm-hmm. Um, and the other one, I don't remember what the, the day the heart sick beasts that chapter. The one, yeah, the the AI ones, the ones that feel like not AI, but like the robot one. No, the clones, the whatever, one? like the, the, the yeah, the, the, the man made ones. Yeah, the yeah. man made beasts. Yeah, I and really like because that. like, I mean, there was obviously commentary about how you treat outside global tensions and how you try to keep mm-hmm. yourself isolated from things, and like the fact that her family like almost died, I was like really nervous about it because that little girl. Who was also a I character know. in Sacrificial Beast. Like, she was my innocence. And I was just like... Yes. Like, Lucille, I was just so nervous about her. And then the Heartsick <laughs> Beast does die, and you always wonder, what happened? Mm-hmm. Like, it was just a lot of unsettlingness, and I was also just, like, really sad about how they were approaching this. Not even a problem? There were just people coming home. Like, <laughs> Yeah, but I think the whole thing is that they were coming home from somewhere that there was like an outbreak of like a disease right wasn't that well it wasn't a disease they were saying that the disease was people being angry and oh right 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 like so yeah it's not a disease right right (laughs) yeah yeah that's fair but i thought so yeah it wasn't like nowadays where we're like yeah we're spreading things to each other we should stop that no it was literally just like well they've been infected by the violence and outbreak of these people rebelling so we can't let them in Mm mm-hmm and people were eating garlic yeah. a lot. Like, there was a lot of weird group think going around. <laughs> I thought oh, it was interesting. And- I, I thought it was interesting that approach, though, because if you take... Obviously, this was written so long ago, but if you consider, like, the way that China, in comparison to a lot of other countries, handled 
the 2020 pandemic. I thought that was really interesting where it's like China really was just like, we're shutting our doors. Sorry. Like if you're not in, you're, you're not in and you're also not coming out. Peace. And I was just like, this is very interesting. <laughs> Consi- no, no, again, I mean, I definitely- considering it was written so long ago. I felt that commentary and I also felt it in when they were voting. It's like, well, we always vote unanimously. Yeah. So that's why, like, it's just. Yeah. It was very, it was very telling. And I thought it was really interesting with the, the kind of context of her writing this. So I will say, I think she mentioned, or like the translator mentioned, it's possible that, because I actually don't know what the SARS response was like in China at the time, because I was too young to remember it, but this was written originally about a year after SARS. So I do wonder oh. if there's some uh, relation there in terms of like what was fresh in her memory. Possible. Who knows? I mean, I also felt like even though I definitely thought, because I knew this was, you know, a Chinese work, you know, I wonder if it's commentary mm-hmm. on Chinese politics, but also it's very mm-hmm. relatable to a lot of close-knit politicking, you know, a lot mm-hmm. of xenophobic, like there's just that type of group mm-hmm. thing is just, it's not unique, 100%. right? <laughs> you know? 100%. 100%. It's like, it's it's one, it's one of those things where you're like, I hate that this is a universal experience, but it really is. <laughs> yeah. Like, unfortunately, it really is. Um. So I think those two were probably like mm-hmm. those are the f- two I thought of, but they were all. Special. I I really like the first one, to be quite honest. I think that was one of my still one of my favorites, the sorrowful sorrowful beasts. I just yeah. thought it was so tragic. The whole like once they start smiling, they die, and I was like, damn, because they're in pain. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like damn. As a highly depressed person, I feel this one. <laughs> I also did appreciate that sometimes I would get confused about what was real, what was not real, what I should be keeping mm-hmm. track of. But normally by the end of a chapter, I was told point blank what had happened. I did. I did like that. I did like that because I was like, I don't know what's going on. And then I would read the little bit at the end. And I was like, I know what's going on. I Sometimes I want the hand holding, And I was like, Thank yeah, you. exactly. And in a lot of ways, it reminds, like, it, it made me think of, like, Nevo's writing, because Nevo is very much, like, she doesn't hold your hand. She, like, very much blurs that line between, like, reality and magic and, like, dreams. And it's very surreal. And the, But then she really doesn't feed it to you in, in any way. So then you're just like, what what just happened? What did I read? So I feel like I like this in a way because it, like, did, <laughs> it did confirm. And you're given plenty of time to be lost. Like, it's not like it spoils the fun. You got to spend mm-hmm. the entire time. And I don't think it spoiled any open endings per, for me, at least. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah, and then I, I think my other standout was also Heartsick Beast, but I think that one more because I really liked. Uh, I don't know. Did you ever watch the TV show Humans? I think it was no. a BBC TV show. It really reminded me a lot of that. Where in Humans, it's about these like super kind of like advanced robots that look exactly like human beings, and like similarly to like Heartsick Beast, where you can like shop around and like find the perfect companion for yourself. That's what they do in humans. And I thought that was like a really, I really like that show and like kind of questions it pose. And I, I really liked kind of the parallels here to that. I mean, yeah, I think was- this was also the point where I started getting confused about our, our narrator's history. Cause I, mm-hmm. I'm like, wait, are you a heart sick beast? <laughs> I think she is. I think, she I is. think so. Yeah. That's what, and I they, think her parent, that's what we her- discovered. And that does is the professor her father like I was getting confused about her family tree, and it, I accepted that yeah. I was, that was fine. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think one of the big reveals that I was like, oh damn, was the the reveal that the professor invented the heartsick beast. I was like, he's the big bad. Okay, <laughs> we're okay. But I think it's that her. I'm confused now. I don't remember. Did I write a note? Because I tried to like write. Because I know the professor Summaries. loved her mother. Like, I know that was, yeah. like, a big thing. Yeah. But I don't think that she... I think she is basically man-made, though, the narrator. Because she's a heartsick beast. But made and to I look in the that, likeness of her mother, I guess. Correct. Because he, the professor loved her mother so much. Yeah. Which is... Sick. The whole book is just like sad. <laughs> I don't know how else when, to describe it. When I was it. watching your vlog and you were saying that, I'm like, oh, you're not wrong, but it didn't make me feel sad because <laughs> I uh, apparently I, am yeah. a heart sick. <laughs> like, I wouldn't say I felt like 
sadness deep inside of me but it was one of those things where it's like it's it's like when you look at something and you're like this is incredibly sad i don't feel anything because i'm a jaded person but like this is so tragic and i i can't like i don't i don't want to accept that this is like thing because it's just, it's just sadness there's no happy vibes i mean at the end no. she gets to have like a person that she's connected with <laughs> Because, like, our, our narrator was so isolated. <laughs> yeah. Also, sorry, the sun. So also, I sorry if you're not... hearing my cat yell to this, the moon. I, I don't really know what he's doing. I love him. <laughs> so cute. Especially being disposed after their child no longer needs them. I have not read Clara and the Sun, and now I'm intrigued. It's a have droid sci-fi literary. Yeah. Um, I will say go into his works expecting more literary and thoughtful stuff than yeah. sci-fi takes, if that makes sense. Because mm -hmm. I read Never Let okay. Me Go, which is, I think, his most famous sci-fi mm -hmm. one. And people are always like, oh, my God, I've never read anything like it. And I'm like, okay. But <laughs> I have read things like it. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I don't know. That's just what I would say. Like, I really liked I do, it as a literary yeah. book, but the sci-fi part yeah. was unamusing to me. I was like, I whatever. do, I do feel like his audience is not like a sci-fi audience in general, though. Like, I feel like he very much has a literary and general fiction audience. Yeah. 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 So. All right. Let's. Shall we discuss the ending and the revelations at the end of this book? Because I. In my head, that's what sticks out the most. Sure. Yeah. What did you think about the ending and this whole reveal that what was the last beast called? Oh. The returning beasts. And the, the returning beasts are not actually beasts, they're actually just humans. Yeah, and it, so returning beasts are humans, and what's his face has then, been a human, right? Zhong Liang. Yeah, he was a human. Yeah. And that's why he had to wear that like bone shard of bone or whatever. And I was like, okay. <laughs> that's cool i guess <laughs> yeah i mean i thought it was it was a fitting reveal like i don't think necessarily i felt like shocked i was like okay mm -hmm. yeah this is definitely where we've been going thematically at least so yeah. to have it be actual is fun mm -hmm. um I, what i thought more chilling about the ending was the fact that you know the implication after she wrote this all the beasts have vanished like the, yeah. the forgetfulness of society or the, the putting things under the rug and everything like that yeah that that loss felt really heavy. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And I thought it was really interesting at the end of the book question. Like for me, I was like, I questioned, I was like, is this city that we're in Yongan, is this the above ground city or the underground city? Has everyone we've met so far been a beast or has everyone been a human? Oh, I thought everyone was a beast. I thought so too. But then I was like, because didn't the professor say everyone's to blame or something and that was the I, I don't know that was her light bulb the character's moment of like oh everyone's you know blaming certain beasts and treating certain beasts mm -hmm. that actually look like beasts differently but everyone's a beast the beast yeah i think that's what it was i think i just was you know when you like you have no brain cells and then you try to think too hard <laughs> i will say this was the chapter that was also the least handholdy <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly um the professor's first heart sick beast was the narrator then taken by the mother that's why he was surprised to see her in his class and pushed her so much oh, okay. Okay. okay i think that was my internal interpretation yeah i think he made her like her mother yeah which is why her mother asked can you love him i.e the professor so there was confusion whether she loved him as a father or as a partner oh i don't know if i got that I always only felt um, mentorship, father, love yeah, between the two. Same. I never got the like partner vibes. Yeah, from no. I mean him specifically. Yeah, and she also like. I mean, as much as she didn't like being lonely per se, mm -hmm. she was not someone who I think was actually always searching for that type of partnership actively. No, that like wasn't no. her her that wasn't her motivation for living. She kind no. of accepted her spinster status a little bit with pride, in my opinion. So, <laughs> I agree. I agree. 
That was I, a thing I, I loved about what's his face and her, how she would always just be like, respect your elders. Like their banter was so silly. I know, I did really like them. I was going to say, I thought they were really cute. And the fact that she was just like, no, like leave me alone, child. Like, <laughs> And he starts so innocuously. He's like, I wanted to talk to the professor and he sent you. <laughs> yeah, I did really like them. And then the whole like side plot with his uncle being obsessed with her. <sighs> And then he was just like calling her and she was like, leave me alone. And he's like, my uncle died. <laughs> and I was like, what? He was so in love with you. That was the Flourishing Beast chapter, right? Yeah, hey, I think so. Because she so. like ran away to go see her like old pseudo grandma figure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and then we the learned that if they chair. Turn, that's their goal to turn into furniture, which was something. Yeah. To, yeah, that was that was interesting. Oh, that was dark. The way that like she opened the chair and there was a finger in it. Oh, <laughs> that was the chapter that I was like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if I want to know what's going on. <laughs> I was like, what is what is happening? <laughs> what is happening? Um, the line, apart from that, they looked like humans. After each description of a beast, I think was indicative of the big reveal at the end. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, the fact that it was like so repetitive as well, like she made a point of saying that every single time. Yeah, and a lot of I these traits were easily hidden. Like it's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I really liked the reveal. I think it was like one of those things. Where I was like, it wasn't that I saw it coming, but it was that like it, I was just like, it all works. It just works so well, and I thought it was done in a way that was very gradual. Like you weren't just like plot twist like. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Some books yeah, are just no, like, and like hey. also the way it ends where she's like and no one even believes me or talks about it, it's like mm -hmm. you know it's the end of the TV show you can zoom out and everything's so obnoxiously normal like yeah like it's that yeah. type of thing where it's like all of these mystical things have been happening and like but actually mm -hmm. on the surface you can't tell and no one's yeah. talking about it no one cares yeah yeah I think that's that's the big sad <laughs> that's really the big sad and I think that's the the I don't know like I feel like this book just reflects so much of like our society that it's just like <sighs> what does this say about our society that this sad sad book is well and like a what reflection was the... of us <laughs> who are the monsters that drive people to suicide what was their name oh uh hold on it was, was the one that... after sacrificial was beasts but the impasse beasts yes I think so I I think that's the one that was after. Yeah. I, well, is there another one after that chapter before Flourishing Beasts? No, that is in Past Beasts. Okay. So, like, there was a lot of commentary in that chapter, you know, about, like, the schools for these kids and, like, what people mm. did with the, like, undesirables and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. And at first... You know, I like was hopeful that, you know, the impasse piece were really nice and taking care of these children. <laughs> and then we learned that, that no, nope. that they they put in this really nope. dark compulsion <laughs> I'm just like, that was a lot i i thought it was interesting in the first few chapters that they really very early on established a kind of like symbiotic relationship between the humans and the beasts which now you're like are they were they really humans or were they just all beasts at the same time but like, but i thought that was interesting like showing kind of like the symbiotic relationships between different groups of people and how like the there's just like this, it's just like a cycle. It's like a cycle of oppression because everyone like is so, I don't know, like resistant to change on both sides that like, I don't know. It's just like, it was just like a really interesting thought for me. No, for sure. that relationship. Yeah, it's I kind of it was like, like this was looking at like the ecosystem of humanity, but like when you look mm -hmm. at ecosystems, you need things to have niches and you need to give them names. And so we're taking certain mm -hmm. human archetypes and we're making them beasts. Mm -hmm. You know, like there are humans that thrive on despair and depression. They are those type mm -hmm. of creatures that we have in our own societies who yeah. prey on those. Like exactly. Yeah. This was definitely a big brain book, Impasse Beasts. Yeah. They live on human despair. Yeah. No, and yeah, it was. I were. think it was a good combination of like big brain. You can really take the red line and compare it to our society. Do all of that, but mm -hmm. also it was still magical and mystical on the surface. Mm -hmm. You know, I could still just like be in this new weird world and like wander the streets mm -hmm. and just see it. 
Yeah. I definitely feel like I want to reread it, though, because I kind of feel like I'm like, I do feel like there will be more to gain from it on reread. Yeah. Because I think the first time around, I was just too caught up in the like, oh, what's going on? What is this like villain of the week situation? (laughs) Yeah. Are Are there any monsters we haven't talked about yet? I think there were some. There was one that was like a love story when she was like in the car accident and he had to transcribe for her. Which I thought was <laughs> a silly time. Um, we have not talked about Joyous Beasts, which is the second chapter. I'm trying to remember what they did. Yeah, me too. Let me look at my note. Oh, my note says this one confused me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, these were the um, little ones, and they like eat. They, like this one was an old lady who fell in love with the person, and they like eat them with their hand, and then they become a big bird in the sky. It was real this, weird. Is this the one where the males don't speak? No, no, no. That was sacrificial. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, this was the one yeah, where the no. mayor died. The mayor died, and there was a big yeah. bird. Yeah. And we learned that birds yeah. were illegal. It's the phoenix. It's the phoenix one. Yeah. Oh, that one was weird. <laughs> That one was weird. I'm telling you, my note just says this one confused me. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that was also... kind of the point, though. Like the first ones were so yeah. like these are beasts, and then we slowly, mm-hmm. you know, get into the more human bestial parts. Yes, exactly. We also haven't talked about Thousand League Beasts, which I genuinely don't think I remember at all. Oh, that was the I one. Think I think was... that's where the professor dies. That's that chapter. They predict the future. And if they are half oh, they go crazy because yes. they can't forget the future they've predicted. Yes, yes, yes. That was depressing. I think that I don't think that one was super memorable for me, clearly. <laughs> I was just like, Well, I was yeah. depressed mainly because she and the professor almost got to meet one last time and she mm. didn't because they have this petulant relationship with each other. Yeah, that's true. I think that's what I remember and most. Then of it. Prime Beasts. Which I think was the chapter, to be honest, I don't really remember the Prime Beast. I think this was the chapter where we learned a lot about the narrator, I feel. And so I don't remember the Beast portion of it at all. Well, didn't we learn the Prime Beast, they were security guards. And this was the one where we potentially found her father, but then I thought she was a heart sick beast, so I was like confused. Yeah, because there was the love. This was the love story between the human and this type of beast, the prime beast. Yes, and yes. there was something about like, for some reason, the offspring of a prime beast will be their demise, and someone was trying to protect this older prime beast she had talked to. And <laughs> I'm telling you, I feel like some of the chapters I read on audio, I just like, I was like, I had a good time with it. It's gone. <laughs> It's I think that gone. was the chapter that made me start being really confused. Because at first I was on board. I'm like, okay, heart sick beast. But then prime beast yeah. happened. And I was like. <laughs> See, here's the thing. I'm like, sometimes I read things. And if I get too confused or they contradict my current understanding of a book, I just forget about it. Because <laughs> well, then we moved into returning beast. And I was like, this makes sense to me. This makes sense to me. <laughs> We're just going to skip the, the ones that didn't make sense to me. <laughs> Well, and also, it's interesting because if they're all beasts, I guess it's just that you have to stay within the prime beast thing and not be with other types of beasts. I think the only reason I got confused was because this was a story she was writing to get by because she had an accident and it was a story her mother had told her. So we were wondering, is this her mother's love story? Right. And then was the professor a prime beast? Professor a prime beast? I do remember having this thought. I I do remember having this thought. (laughs) So, uh, yeah. It was confusing. I don't know. It, the whole thing is confusing. Because it, it, it's, is it like every single is every single character you meet is a beast, except for the one who is not. I think so. Because I think mm-hmm. the, only the person who had the necklaces are human or returned mm-hmm. beast or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I also like the dystopian energy of all the humans live underground. I approve. I agree. <laughs> I agree. I do... I don't know. I do. I did. I did find it. I do do remember at the end being like, is the city that we've been in the whole time, which city are we in? I mean, I I mean, I, I truly did think that it was the city with all the beasts, um, mm-hmm. but I could see that ambiguity being intentional. 
Like, yeah. you know, it's kind I of like one of those things where like, you've been on this dreamlike journey with me and now you can question it. Like, I don't think mm -hmm. that's necessarily a wrong confusion to have happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting. The other kind of interesting thing I thought was um, that in the book, the author in the book is a romance author, which, you know, you think are, are like happy vibes, but then this book itself is like so fucking sad, but also contains like, a whole bunch of like love stories like a lot of the beasts and their stories contain like a love story they're just not romances <laughs> yeah no they're not they don't got that happily ever after energy um, they're they're not well, they're not about that genre romance life <laughs> she's just such an interesting character that like because she doesn't find herself interesting we don't get a lot of that because mm -hmm. she also she, you know she used to be a zoologist who was fairly okay at what she did left to become a full-time author who wrote romance these beast books and a food column <laughs> like, that was a part of the book. <laughs> it's like okay. <laughs> yeah, I do think though, like based on a couple of interviews I've seen though, that she said that at the time because she wrote this one, I think when she was twenty one, and so she's like, she was saying how like now looking back on it, she was like, it's interesting because like I I can see how I self inserted myself into this book, <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> I mean, I guess that's interesting. Has she written anything else that was translated to English? Um, I think her most famous book is The Chili Bean Pace Clan, um, also translated by Jeremy Chung. Um, and that one is more of like a contemporary like family drama. So it's very, very different. Um, and allegedly, this is like the only book of hers that's really like considered a fantasy. I mean, fair. Like, I don't need yeah. to read fantasy yeah. to be fulfilled. Yeah. Although I'm much to probably everyone's chagrin. I've classified this as science fiction for reasons beyond oh. me, but it felt like I was reading sci-fi. No, I, so I, I also I also agree. I feel like the questions that are posed in this book are very sci-fi vibes. It gave more me like so noir cyberpunk energy. Like I felt that setting more adjacently to this. I know a lot of people go magical realism, and I'm just like, I, I wouldn't call this magical realism personally. I I really don't think it's. I think it's too too much to be magical realism if that makes yeah. sense uh Joanne is the human yeah he had the necklace not yeah. sure what beast the professor was supposed to be well and yeah. also okay so another argument for the professor potentially being a prime beast is mm -hmm. he does die i think because of when we were in the thousand league beast chapter because of mm -hmm. going to see her and if there is the whole like prime beast will be killed by their offspring energy but then of course he made oh her, so interesting act i don't know is she oh, actually an offspring that's why i got confused tammy <laughs> <laughs> listen you're, you're way less confused than i am clearly i'm really here being like did i even read this book i swear i did <laughs> i just don't think i comprehended it I mean, I it's think weird because I'm like, I, yeah, it's weird because I'm like, I enjoyed this book. Did I understand it? Questionable. Arguably not. <laughs> like, well, because I, I think there is this big question of like, okay, so if everyone above ground is a beast, we've only looked at a handful of beasts. What is mm -hmm. the average beast, right? Like, what was her family? Like Lucille's parents. Right. We right. don't really know. Like, what's his mm -hmm. name's parents, um, Liang's parents, like, what were his? Like, we don't know what types of beasts people are, I guess, on average. Which I guess speaks to the whole idea yeah. of these stereotypes, these markers that we get told mm -hmm. about a beast. That is not enough to know if someone's No, beast. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So. It's like, how did they howl at the moon this week? That's how you know it's a sorrowful <laughs> beast. Like... <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, I know. Like I how remember. we use our astrological signs to determine who's a Scorpio. Like I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. Astrological signs are a big question mark for me. I don't. I I never pay attention to them, but sometimes people on Twitter will just be like, "Well, I have this energy because I'm a Virgo," and I'm like, "Okay." <laughs> it's like some. It's when people say to you, they're like, "You give off whatever vibes," and I'm like, "I don't even know what that means. I don't know what that means. I don't." I'm... Yep. Yep. Um... Yeah. Um, what else? I don't know. I just I feel like I have spent more time researching about the author and like her thought process around this book more so than like understanding the book. And now I'm just like, I don't know what I'm talking about. Well, what did the you didn't tell me about the author stuff. Share. 
Oh, well, I said some of it, but I, th I thought actually one of the things she talks about a lot is that she wrote this book almost as a way to, because she wrote this book as a way to take a break from her like usual writing. Um, and she needed a break because her mother had just passed away recently. And so for her, she said that writing the Flourishing Beast chapter was very therapeutic for her because it was kind of that, uh, I mean, A, the, the, the whole like mother figure, I think that really came up in that chapter but also she said like the the idea of the flourishing beast and like how they re re not regenerate yeah. but they like re find new life sort of, yeah, yeah like find find a new life kind of thing and i thought that was like a really nice thing for her to have and then she said that reading it now again like at, when it was republished that was like a really nice like thing for her to reread which I thought was I mean, it makes sense. Her main character goes through many different types of loss. So much! So, so much, much loss, like, so much change. Like, this, this woman is going through it. <laughs> like, it's all in, like, four months. It's, like, not a lot of time. I could not quite get, like, a sense on how much time had passed between We started each. in early, early fall, whatever fall months exist where this city is, and it ends a little bit in the beginning of the new year. So I guess in my head, yeah. I imposed my own U S seasons on it mm -hmm. for better or worse. I don't know how much that would align, but I started it in October and I ended it in January. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair. I do think new year is referring to the lunar new year. If I'm okay. not mistaken. Um, just cause in Chinese culture, when we say new year, we typically do mean the new and when the is the year. lunar new year normally i know the moon changes so it's, it's around hard. february is probably okay. um where it is it's still in my head felt like less than half a year yeah i i definitely think it wasn't that long of a period of time but yes definitely like over times where i'm like is this i this is another moment of me overthinking because i was like is this story non-linear <laughs> And then I quickly was like, no, 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 it's, it's no, 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 not. that's the no, one no. grace we have. It is beginning to end in order. <laughs> but I really, I think I also just like really wanted it to be non-linear because I love non-linear storytelling. It's you need to read like... The Last Wish. That's all non-linear. Okay, Those stories okay, are okay. not in order. <laughs> okay. Because I remember being at one point, I was like, let me just take out my, I'm like, let me just reorder these in the order I think they happen. And then I, and then I quickly realized, I was like, no, they're just, they're just in order. <laughs> Uh, Jiang Tan killed the professor because he mentioned killing an innocent man, but he couldn't escape faith and save I really could not tell you anything about this chapter. <laughs> Quite frankly, I, I genuinely know, don't I mean, remember, I remember this, this at all. Kind of line, but I thought it was more of a metaphorical for some reason because I thought maybe he thought by revealing fate he had condemned someone to die. I didn't know if it was an actual like he took the weapon but i'm unsure did i accidentally skip a chapter while i was flipping between the audiobook and the physical is it really that that much of a blank space where the professor dies it really is no it really is such no i remember him dying well that's the chapter this is in this is when he dies i don't remember anything else of that chapter then <laughs> yeah there's like an arc there's a dig site where they find a thousand league beasts and she keeps talking to this um the, the person who's mentioned in this comment mm -hmm. about it mm -hmm. and then the, keeps trying to talk to the professor about it and can't get in touch with like the main person of the dig who i thought was mm -hmm. the person that maybe was mentioned about being killed because then he comes up as dead and then the professor dies mm -hmm. and then that's yes. when we learn about all the prophecy and how this one individual was not a complete thousand league beast and because of that most thousand league beasts lose the prophecy memories after their children and can just keep going through life. oh no i do remember this this yeah. i do remember okay yeah fake that's what fake. i got that's that's my uh it's a, it's a vague <laughs> i have a vague memory listen guys because i think i read this one from um, last <laughs> sunday brains. or monday okay I mean, I, I read this all this week, but I clearly <laughs> retained so little. <laughs> Truly retained so little. Um, any other thoughts? Um, I like the color co cover more than the black and white one. I totally agree. I hate this color <laughs> situation. I In general, I really don't like black and white covers with one like accent color. So I just hate this, <laughs> to be quite well, honest also, with you. I this Another book experience this reminded me of was The Best of All Possible Worlds by Karen Lord, which also has a really pretty oh. colorful hardback, but a black and white paperback cover. 
But why? that one, I like. Why it. must they do this? I, I don't know. But that one was also very episodic because each chapter is them traveling to a different part of this world to try and find people who would um, culturally and genetically align with these refugees. It's a sci fi book. Um, and it has this okay. overarching slow burn romance that I really liked. I do want to read some Karen Lord because I watched her interview that she did with Ken Liu. And I was just like, these two brains, I love you need it. To, so, you know, I already know, I know both of them because I've met Ken Liu mm -hmm. and I know for a fact, I bet I can get him on my channel. And then Karen Lord, I know through a friend. <laughs> And I just need to get them, oh. like, Nikki Drayden. I, I just, I need to have the, I need to fear emails less. <laughs> That's, fear fair. Emails. That's fair. That's uh, fair. I, I feel like to... Ken Liu is very open to, like, doing interviews and stuff, I think. Well, yeah. And, well, and, like, we have this moment where he was giving a talk at Brookline Booksmith, and I was the audience member who would look at him. And so he, I was his, I was his rock. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. It's like, oh, he needed to look at someone. It's like, I didn't, I didn't flinch. I was there. <laughs> I sat in the front row like such a nerd. <laughs> well, right. I sat in the front row. I'm like, what? What is this? I mean, I'm five two, so I can't. I can't be risking people sitting. <laughs> you risking it all in the back. <laughs> Me when I went to see Rebecca Kwong in person, and I got there only half an hour early, and turns out people were there three hours early, and so I was like way at the back, and I was like, I don't see anything. Even when when I put my camera all the way up, like I can't see anything. Yeah, she's a bit more popular than Ken. <laughs> she is. I didn't even get try to get wild. to see her here because she was in Harvard's bookstore, and I'm like, I'm not crossing the river. Mm -mm. Nobody ever comes here, so when she came, I was like, I gotta, I gotta go. But it was actually terrible. I don't know if I ever want to go to another author signing ever again. <laughs> they're nice when they're small. When it's like a mid tier, like yeah, it's like that's middle true. list. It's really nice. It was just so chaotic. I waited two hours for a signature, but by the time I got to the front, she wasn't signing all the books anymore. <laughs> no, no. But if Nevo ever comes like, to you, you gotta see her. Oh, no, Nevo. If Nevo ever comes. First of all, I would have to buy a bunch of her books physically because I don't actually own a lot of them physically. Well, you're supposed to buy a book at the signing anyway, so just do it there. True. That is true. But yes, if Nevo ever comes, I will be like, ma'am, I'm your biggest fan ever. Like, truly, your number one fan. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think mid-list <laughs> authors, it's really fun because they actually really appreciate people who come and, like, will make time to actually answer questions. That's fair. It's That's really fair. nice. I mean, I'm lucky yeah, no. I live down the street from, like, a really great indie that gets a lot of authors, so I have, like, the experience yeah. of, like, the very local no one knows them to, like, Brandon Sanderson came and had to rent the theater across the street. Like, <laughs> Oh. Yeah, no one ever comes here. That was <laughs> no one comes before. here. That was, he was so popular. I think even Fonda, Lee, Fonda Lee came here when she was still, like, it was still Jade City days, because she's also originally from Toronto, I think, or she used to live here. Um, so she's done stuff here earlier in her career, but not anymore, sadly. Yeah. <sighs> well, I don't have any other specific thoughts. I really loved reading this. Um, I'm so glad you were like, Angela, will you read this? And I was like, sure. And full disclosure, for book club reads or anything, I just say yes. Like, I just read the book. <laughs> I don't, like, I don't, maybe for myself, I should check once in a while to see if it's for me or anything, but this was. <laughs> so that was <laughs> I'm so glad you enjoyed it. And I'm very, very grateful that you were my first guest. Isn't Stephanie your next guest? Am I making that up? Yes, I think she is. I have to double check that she's still down for it. But she is my next guest. We are reading uh, The Way Spring Arrived. And oh, I story. read that one. You have read that one. It's I am good. really excited for that one. Uh, it's a little oh. chunky. I'm not going to lie. I'm like... I can't. The audio book like, is good and it has a lot of through it. Oh, okay. Let me see if There's I have a credit I can use on it. Yeah, my books, my, my library did have access, but I know Canadian and US libraries are like, they have different curation systems. But, um, yeah, we we don't get a lot of the Tor.com titles. Yeah, I, I, audio, I Tor.com's a lot cheaper in the United States. Yeah. Tor.com is extortionate. Extortionate. It's not my. I, yeah, it's it's fair. It. yeah, it's awful. I hate well, it. Well, also, just don't like. I mean, I guess I don't know how much you Thank even you like short reading. stories, but I really like the short stories, even though everyone ho and hums on the internet being like they were okay. I like the essays. I'm like, no, the short stories are good short stories. You just don't know what are good short stories. Like, oh, see, no. I I like the idea of a short story, but I feel as though I like them in theory more than I 
I do in reality. But I'm still excited for it. I, I'm looking forward to it. And I, I do like that there are essays. Do I actually enjoy reading essays either? I'm sure. <laughs> Luckily, the essays are all only a couple pages, so they're not like super. Oh, they're long. not like okay. And they're okay. all surrounded around a particular thing that that author wanted to talk about about translation, which I think is just like See, kind that's of a fascinating it. thing. Yeah, that is interesting to me because I do like to just read about translation and translation. And I do think you'll at least find you will find out what you do and don't like about short stories with the anthology because there's a wide range of them. Okay. Yeah. It's like there's That's some flash good. fiction, there's some longer form, there's some more fantastical, there's some more strict sci-fi. There's definitely mm -hmm. some you're going to take more from than me because there's even in the translation, sometimes the authors would be like, when do you define a thing that is common knowledge in Chinese culture versus right. it's like most people yeah. don't need to be told who this dragon is. This dragon is very well right. known. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. it's, that's always an interesting thing, eh? Like localization, like how far do you go? Because I, I know some translators do. Actually, that was another thing I did notice about this. This is so clearly localized for a British audience. It is <laughs> wild to me. It's actually wild to me. I was reading, okay, first of all, sign number one is because we in Canada, we get both uh, UK books and also US books sometimes. And mm -hmm. the, the way you can really tell is like quotations, because in the UK, the outside quotations are single quotations, inside is double, whereas in the US, it's the other way around. So oh, that's how yeah. you can usually tell a UK book from a US book. And in this book, even though this is technically the US edition, it, they use single quotations. So I, I origin, all, already from the get-go, I was like, what is happening? What is going on? But then there are certain words that they use. So for example, I can't imagine in the, the, the Chinese version, it would have been the specific word, but it was, it would, probably would have been some sort of like a cup noodle, instant noodle type of thing. But in the book, they used the word pot noodles, which is a very specific to the UK brand. And I was like, interesting. This, these are very interesting choices because sometimes also with translations, they'll, if it's very, very localized, like they're like very specifically localized like that, they'll change things when they publish it in the US. And I just thought it was like, so interesting that it was so obviously localized for the UK. Is the translator from England? I believe they live in the UK. I think they're originally from Singapore though. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah. those are, I'm really bad at noticing some things because if some things don't add to the scene <laughs> for me, I just like, I'm like, mm, whatever. Because I think yeah, when I fair. saw pot noodle, I think I knew it wasn't like hot pot, but my brain just went noodles, fun. <laughs> no, so it's it's literally like, cup noodles like what we would call cup noodles but like in the year we just call them ramen no but it specifically comes in a cup and all you have to do is add hot water yeah i don't know what they're called here other than maybe um, ramen yeah <laughs> yeah so like the brand that they usually sell in north america is called cup noodles which is from japan and then in the uk they have their own brand called pot noodles so everyone calls it like instant noodles in the uk pot noodles okay so i thought that was like i just i just i was like that was one thing that was like interesting choices here? i mean i did notice like a lack of coffee but like i <laughs> <laughs> i mean even in china though like not everyone drinks coffee it's a very it, well very it's just tea. one of those things where like i don't think i noticed it because like you're saying it's like well i don't even know if that's like i don't know if tea or coffee or something else would be more common and i feel mm -hmm. like i associate tea more with asian cultures than i do coffee 100 mm -hmm. so. percent hello read this book a ways back and loved it Yay! Tammy loved it. Don't let the three and a half star fool you. I did enjoy it a lot. I clearly didn't understand as much of it as I thought I did. <laughs> and I clearly need to reread it. It, it did, did make your rereadable like rating. Because you have, where's your cutoff where you will reread a book in your rating scale? Three. Okay. Three. Mm -hmm. See, I'm mine's very higher. I, I, think, I yeah. feel like I don't reread unless it's like a four and a half or a five. Like, I have to, like, really love it. I think the thing that, for me, is, though, that some books just are rereadable books, regardless of the rating I gave them. And some books, even if I give it a five stars, I'm like, I don't want to reread this. If that okay. makes sense. But, yeah. yeah, this is definitely a reread. I definitely need to reread this one. Perhaps when I have more brain cells. <laughs> Mayhaps. <laughs> no, I think you should do the opposite. Try it when you're actually feeling less brain cells. Because, honestly, you might get an epiphany. You don't know. You don't know when your brain's going to make connections. <laughs> you have no clue. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, I guess this is it. We'll wrap it up. Angela, any anything you want to plug? Plug.
dog. No, no. Join well, this I book have... club. You already did if you made it this far. <laughs> well, I'll have, I have, I, if I don't have it already, I have Angela's channel down below. Go follow her. Um, yeah, thank you all for joining. Angela, thank you for joining me. And Thanks for having we'll me. We'll see you soon.